So um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. It is, it is my pleasure and honor to have Dr. Tudora and Professor Halawa and Dr. Hadidi with us from um, UK. Uh, so Dr. Halawa, would you please start to introduce your guests? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, Tudora uh, Minya is a philosopher and interested, deeply interested in medical ethics and ethics in general. Uh, she's planning to develop ethic modules in the University of Liverpool. Ethics, of course, one of the difficult topics to teach, actually a difficult topic to understand, to start with. And she's taking this on her shoulder, which uh, I wish her good luck. Thank you. So uh, it puts me in a very challenging position, how to speak in front of very professional, dedicated for the ethics, I, I think ethics in, for ethics, there is a common ground all over the world. And there is some peculiar characteristic from area to area, but uh, we are lucky because in medical ethics, it seems that the ethics is common. But we can say 90% there is agreement between different countries about the medical ethics. So uh, if you allow me, I'm going to start the session by my presentation about medical ethics. And uh, would you please, if you would like to, to comment or to highlight some interesting points, please uh, just uh, click on the button, raise hand, and you will take the lead uh, immediately. So I'm going to share my presentation in a second. And this is the uh, I, I, this is a, the 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 topic, basics and pearls, and this is the course within the Mansoura Internal Medicine postgraduate course, and today we have the honor and the pleasure to have uh, prestigious uh, professors and guests from UK. So to start with, this is the focus of the session. I start with introduction and some philosophical points and different domains of ethics. Then I give uh, concentration on the, the informed consent process because it is full of ethics and uh, how to break bad news because uh, as we are dealing with chronic kidney disease patients, always we are dealing, this is, this is our life to deal with bad news. So uh, we should know how to deal with bad news. Then one of the most important point in our career is how to appear professional. I like professionalism, even when I was invited to speak about medical ethics in one of the conferences in Upper Egypt, I preferred to change the topic from ethics into pillars of professionalism, because it is a more polite term if we speak in conferences. And then some applications of ethics in dialysis and transplantation and some points. It is impossible to cover all ethical points because this is the life, life equal ethics. But, uh, and uh, I, I'm going to start with, is there a difference between ethics and the law? Yes, there is a great difference. And I think from philosophical point of view, in law, a man is guilty when he uh, uh, violates the rights of others. Ethics, ethics, he is guilty if he only uh, thinking of do so. This means that ethics is superior to the uh, law. And ethics doesn't mean religions. There is a difference between religions and ethics. Uh, but fortunately, the common grounds of all uh, religious, even if they are different, uh, are based on ethics in the majority of their issues. So in medicine, many clinical choices created by advances in medical technology uh, are essentially ethical. What does it mean? If you ask me, Professor Halawa, what is the best treatment replacement therapy for a patient who has end-stage renal disease, I'll say immediately renal transplantation. End-stage heart disease, cardiac transplantation. In the stage liver disease, liver transplantation. But can anybody agree that for infertile male or female, we can accept testicular or ovarian transplantation? Uh, nobody, it is banned 
because of ethics. Uh, patients are increasing, this is another point. So ethics dictates what to do. The second point, uh, in, in all over the world nowadays, there is increasing awareness from the patient perspectives of their legal and their rights. And this increases the issue of medical legal problems. And it seems that the young, uh, the young physicians are not trained well on even the medical legal aspects that we should take care of it. And I agree with, the, uh, with this conclusion of the New England paper. It may be important, uh, may, may be very important uh, to inspire, to aspire young physicians to understand the patients social, environmental, and the personal characteristics, and the complex health care systems as to grasp basic biological process. So because as all of us know, the definition of health, according to WHO definition, it is a state of well-being from physical, mental, social, and psychological well-being, and not only the absence of the disease. So how to build all these attitudes and uh, areas in educating uh, doctors. And this is one of the philosophical points I like to share with you. A good physician is characterized by three A's, this, this from England, from UK uh, culture, and three R. What are the three A? Three A including uh, ability. So physician should be able to do his job medical, surgical, whatever the specialty he should be able. And the ability include clinicals and the skills, information, the skills, the decision-making, all these under the term ability. The second point is availability. How, how to take care uh, uh, of uh, my responsibility while I'm leaving uh, the area of uh, duty? It is, uh, it is nonsense, so availability. If I am very able and I'm not available, how to do my job. The third and the most important from my point of view is affability. Uh, a physician should be affable. Affable means nice. Because as, as in the quotation mentioned, it is uh, nice to be important, but it is more important to be nice. If I have a physician who is very able, capable, and available every all the time, 100% availability, 100% ability and competency. But he is dealing with uh, his colleagues and paramedical in a very harsh way. How to withstand him? I don't like this, this style at all. The three R's are, we should uh, know how to respect ourselves and respecting others and how to, to take care of our responsibility. And I think all these are within the ethical domains. And this is a funny equation. If we put the letters in English and the corresponding number, A1, B2, C3, A, T, C, then what about uh, knowledge? If you, if, you write, if you look at the, 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 the number of K, N, O, W, you'll find knowledge equal 96. If we say it is percent, it's 96%. Because knowledge is, is, is very important, crucial. How to build experience without knowledge, it is very difficult. Okay. Uh, hard work. Hard work. Uh, we should uh, be hard worker, and we discussed with Professor Halawa how the uh, here at Urology and Nephro Center we train physicians to tolerate hard work. So hard work equals 98. This is a funny equation, but luck is just 47. And the most important for my mind is attitude. Why attitude? Because if you just uh, put the, the the numbers of attitude you will find it equal 100. So what I want to say, uh, for dealing with patients, we want uh, the physician to know informations, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. These are the triad of medical education. And attitude 
is governed by ethics. So we can say, if this are the, uh, the knowledge, they are, the knowledge is very crucial. So if I just have knowledge only, I am a, a bookworm reading everything, but this is, this, that's all. So what I have is this fragmented dots. But if I have an experience added to knowledge, then I can join points together. And if I have a wisdom, uh, it, it will be more constructive. And the superb is how to move toward the creativity. For, uh, so this is just in uh, drawing, show the difference between knowledge, experience, wisdom, and creativity. But put in mind, please, that without knowledge, we have nothing. If I am able and ethical, but I don't know anything in medicine, and I am not updated, there's, there's nothing. So knowledge is essential. Building experience and wisdom and creativity, all these are a very important points. The most important concept in the ethics is do no harm. Brimam no nusir, which was established from Hippocrates in the oath of Hippocrates from the fifth century. So, and I think all of you, Professor Halawa and Dr. Tudora, uh, the uh, uh, harm should be, at least if we don't do benefit for the patient, we shouldn't do harm. It is very bad that the patient comes to us to relieve his or her suffering, and at the end of the day, we chair in the process of harm. And as I am a physician and a medical person, cure, I should put this, this in my mind and my belief when I deal with the patient. Cure sometimes, treat often, but always I should build comfort with the patient. And this is the Arabic uh, uh, oath of the physician. And here I, and I uh, lined the, uh, this sector of the Arabic status, and this is a translation from the English one, is uh, about uh, education. Because as I discussed with Professor Halawa yesterday, I, I like this, uh, the annual of the, uh, that was published by, uh, in the Annal of Internal Medicine last year from American College of Physician. And I like this word, doctor from the Latin, docer. Docer means to teach. To teach whom? To teach ourselves, to teach uh, our colleagues, to teach patients. So one of the ethical uh, points, which is very crucial, is to learn how to teach the patients. This is our job, to be teacher, to teach ourselves, to teach our colleagues, and to learn from others. And at the end of the day, uh, we teach the patients to share knowledge with the patients. And I like the Sir William Osler statement, a doctor is a student till his death. When he fails to be a student, he dies. Or by another way, a doctor is a student until he dies. Once he considers himself not a student anymore, the doctor inside him dies. And this is why I read this symbol. This is my, my personal symbol of life, is I am living because I'm learning. And in you can, in, you can, you, you, in the United States, there is another term which is learning through teaching. And I find living through learning is superior because if I wanted to be proud by myself, I, should, uh, I, I am very proud by uh, that, uh, that I am an educable person. This is why we established the system of education in nephrology. This is Egyptian study of nephrology and transplantation virtual academy that was published as a sort of tele-education, including lectures, videos, uh, assignments, exams since 2012. And uh, up to this moment, we have this uh, treasure of lectures and videos, and even the MD, PhD degree in nephrology of Mansoura, everything in this template. So this is an introduction. For ethics and the medicine, we can uh, remember ethics and the medicine under the mnemonic of A, B, C, D, E. So these are the axes of ethics, autonomy. And I'm going to explain 
how to respect autonomy. Beneficence, as we agreed, uh, confidentiality, it's very impo important, crucial to keep the patient's secrets. We shouldn't breach the patient's confidentiality because it, it puts us under the law even. Doing no harm, this is the, 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 the first step. Then dealing with all people, or regardless of their race, religion, anything uh, in equality and justice, so long as we are in the duty of care. This is our responsibility to be fair as we uh, can. And this is how the, these principles are defined. Beneficence means the duty to promote good and, uh, good and act in the best interest of the patient. Non-malficence, the duty do no harm. Respect for patient autonomy, and I'm going to uh, uh, discuss it in detail uh, in a minute. Justice, to be fair for every person have the, uh, the right to be treated. How to respect patient's autonomy? And uh, I summarized the respecting autonomy under eight aspects, eight points. Number one, the patient had the right to, uh, uh, to refuse, this is, and this is very important, to refuse a recommended type of treatment and to be informed uh, by a smart way of the medical consequences of this action. Sometimes uh, we review the updated guidelines and we are uh, concentrating on the best level of evidence. But when we discuss with the patient, the patient may select the second level of evidence because this is according to his preference. So, but my rule from the ethical point of view is to explain to him the consequences of this decision. He has, and this is very important in academic centers, he has the right to, he or she, by the way, the patient has the right to consent or decline to participate in research. And fully informed, and this is very important, before uh, the research. Be treated with respect, dignity, courtesy, compassion, and the cultural sensitivity. We should uh, be uh, smart in these points. Have any treatment possible complications explained in an under understandable manner. The, be allowed to obtain second opinion, and I think uh, when uh, I was uh, uh, in, in the starting of my career, it was very sensitive issue when I do my best with the patient and at the end of the game, uh, he talked to me, can I go to, uh, to uh, do you know one who is expert in this field? In, <laughs> in this scenario, I, the doctor will be angry. We should, by time we learn it not to be angry. And by time we learn it even how to help him to nominate the best in the field and to write a summary. And this is very important summary by his presentation or her presentation and what was done and what the patient is seeking for. So this is his right from the ethical point of view. He has the right to designate relatives or friends to be kept informed of their medical conditions. And he only has the right to do that. So I cannot breach his confidentiality uh, to anyone uh, because it may lead to disastrous end. Be informed about names dosages, indications, adverse reactions of all prescribed medications, be fully informed about the results of lab analyses and any tests they undergo. If we put all these points together, this means that we should speak to the patient. And I remember one of the uh, very wise statement, uh, patients comes to the doctors, especially in managing chronic diseases, just to find a person who hear him, who listens to him. So we should learn how to listen to the patient, to contain the patient. One of the most important and very difficult issue, and I think we uh, tested it in the era of COVID-19, how to prioritize the patient in, in the presence of disaster, disaster triage. And if we have many patients who suffered from 
respiratory failure, and need ventilator, and we have lack of ventilators and lack of ICU beds. How to deal with these patients? I think it is very, uh, very critical issue and a very difficult situation. I don't like to uh, witness or to experience, but it seems that it was there through uh, some countries last, uh, in, the, in this era of COVID-19. So this is one of the um, articles discussing this point in a systematic review. So th these are the points, and I, I, I would like if Dr. Teodora would comment on this point because it's very critical for us. So here, they bought medical measures, medical needs, seek the first, listen, uh, likely to benefit, uh, survivability to put in mind, uh, non-medical measures, uh, younger age, better quality of life. So a lot of points and their description in this systematic review to select the patients. Would you like, please, to comment here, Dr. Tudora? Please. Yes, I would, I would comment. Uh, you yes. like me to comment now? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, well, thank you. I, um, I was thinking about this topic a lot because, um, as you said, there are unprecedented times with um, the COVID-19. And um, I was recently uh, reading some um, articles uh, in the American Journal of Bioethics. And actually, they, they said there how, for example, in the United States, uh, they were dealing with, um, you know, those, uh, those ethical problems. And I was, um, of course, I mean, the main ethical problem is that you have a big number of patients and you have limited, limited resources. So it's a problem of resource allocation. And in a problem of it, um, resource allocation, it's something that I would call it now the ethics of triage because you have you have to do a triage now the problem is how do you do the ethical triage you know um is it based on clinical outcomes and then the clinical outcomes is based on evidence which you know that's that's the uh what can i say that's part of the medical ability you know to have informed decision based on evidence yeah and I read about, um, for example, two uh, systems that are used in, in this case. Uh, one is uh, called SOFA, so Sequential Organ Failure Assessment for adult patients. And the other one is called, uh, for, for children, is called Pediatric Logistic Organ Dysfunction. So those are, if you like, the medical indicators based on evidence of the patient's outcome. However, it's not 100% that this, you know, that they will provide uh, a total accurate um, criteria for triage. And then um, they were trying to, um, to, to come with more um, criteria, you know, for deciding that. And then um, those criteria, so how the patient will benefit, they were regarding the quality of life, so that after you know, you, you come with this measure, this patient will have a quality of life that you, you think it's worth um, uh, pursuing. Um, the others are short-term um, survival chances. That means survival uh, chances when they're out of the hospital. And the others are the long-term survival, you know, survival rates. So how, so all of those three criteria, uh, they, they try to be applied to the patient. So, uh, in order to to make the best decision yeah so now the problem is um ethicists are quite not happy about that because that means to prioritize for example younger patients because obviously they will have a better long-term survival chances than elderly but then from the ethical point of view you committed discrimination based on age yeah so that's ages men and you cannot do it then Regarding the quality of life, if you take this criteria, then you have a problem that people with disabilities will not score here. So then you discriminate against people with disabilities. Uh, and the same, you can, you can uh, talk about uh, short-term survival rates and how, so none, none of those um, measures used now are totally soundproof from ethical point of view. 
and it is uh, I I read something quite disturbing from me from ethical point of view, but apparently that was used in America. So we have the doctors, and this is why I'm very passionate, you know, about that because they are like soldiers. Yeah, they are frontline, and they have to deal with that. And of course, we rely on them to, to keep the epidemic under control and so on. And then in terms of resource allocation, the question was, should they be prioritized? And of course, every possible answer is, you know, ethically and morally is to say, yes, they should be prioritized. And then it's interesting how different health systems are prioritizing that. So for example, in America, they said they will have priority to go to medicine in case a, a drug is discovered that you know will help that or to vaccination however frontline key workers are not prioritized for going to ventilators because they said if you are at this stage you know to spend days in the icu the chances that you return to frontline are quite slim i you know I was absolutely bluffed about that. I, uh, because, you know, you have a fiduciary duty to do those people, they help the society, and then you think you have to help them. But, you know, the health systems are very, are very different. And it's, um, it's, it's really, really a big, a big problem um, in, from, from this point of view. Uh, so this is why um, I think we need a new ethical framework for this uh, triage uh, situation and it is extremely unfair i was talking to to someone who does medical law and as, as you said you know I, I very much like that you know law is about infringing someone's rights and ethics is about you know thinking about stuff mm -hmm. but you know without thinking we cannot have the laws and but the laws you know, are helping us as well to think in a certain way. Because if you, if we know that we have a treaty of human rights, <laughs> which we don't want to sign off with, uh, uh, that's the story, then we think we, we are um, educated like this and we, we think in this direction as well. So what my colleague from law was telling me is that, for example, in the UK, the government did not give clear guidelines regarding this prioritization. In other countries, they did. So I think the Italian government, they said, okay, those are the, the lines and the doctor should do A, B, C, and D. Yeah? So now for me, it's, it's quite unfair regarding the physicians because they are compelled to do, to take, to, to do ethical decisions without very clear guidelines and automatically they will be liable from that. You know, they, they are exposed and, and the government here are not, is not baking them up, you know, in order to say, okay, I had to do this choice because that was what was, I don't know, prescribed or agreed upon as a measure. So this is why I, I, I find, you know, it's, it's a very complex situation, how we do ethical decisions and who is backing us up because um, I like very much your presentation and your principles. You know, my, my specialty in ethics is ethics of care. And they are, the principles of ethics of care are very similar, are nearly the same with what you put in a medical ethics. And I like that because more applied and more clear, you know. But the society has a duty, you know, towards the doctors, not, not only towards the patient, but towards the doctor to support them in this role. And I, I feel that in the present time, they are not supported. You know, not, not that they are sent without protective equipment, which is pretty gross, negligence, you know. But um, they, they are failed. And, and I think it's, it's very important now to, to talk about, you know, the ethical issues because it's, as I said, it, it, it's a problem. And it's like how you, le you left them with this dramatic decision. Yeah, to, to see who, who will get saved. And there are only, I heard, 8,000 um, ventilators in the UK. And you see there are 700 people, 800 people dying every day. So, so. I think it is, a, it is a very terrible issue that we live in the COVID-19 era. 
But I think uh, the positive issue is, uh, uh, I think it will leave us uh, to be prepared, how to prepare ourselves uh, in advance to face like these disasters in the future. I think this it will be the best way. But uh, uh, because of limited resources, I think someone will pay the price. Well, uh, this is the problem of the lack of resources. Let us go to uh, one of a uh, little bit uh, less uh, uh, painful, uh, uh, the process of informed consent. consent. Because uh, we have the principles of five W questions uh, about what, what is this maneuver and why I should receive this uh, or agree on this maneuver, how this maneuver will be done, uh, either surgery or biopsy or whatever. Uh, what is the risk benefit? And what are the precautions, if there are complications, how to do precautions to lessen the occurrence of complications. So principally, these are the five debuts that should be conducted to the patient whenever we think of any intervention by a very uh, understandable language. So language should be clear, understandable, simple, and the patient uh, has the right to agree or to refuse the intervention. If we apply these principles on renal biopsy, so this is invasive maneuver, we consider renal biopsy as an operation because we take part, small piece of the kidney, including vessels and tissues, so this is a surgery. So the, uh, we should explain to the patient what is it in a very small way. It is piece of the kidney. It will not lead to renal failure because some patients uh, imagine that we are removing part very big part of the kidney. It is very small piece of the kidney. Uh, why? Why we need biopsy? Either because it will guide our treatment. So instead of treating the patient with immune suppressive drugs, which may be unnecessary if the biopsy is done, so the biopsy will, will lead the treatment in a very safe manner. Or even telling the prognosis this patient will uh, be uh, the, the graft failure for, for kidney transplant patient or renal failure in native kidney patient. What is the expectation to prepare ourselves for the management in the future? So we should be clear for the patient. It will be prognostic only. It, it is prognostic and therapeutic. Uh, how to be done? It's done under local anesthesia, so mild pain, and the anesthesia will uh, lead the pain away. Then it is done live by ultrasound, so we'll see the, uh, the needle uh, proceed to the kidney, and the patient should stay in bed for eight hours after the biopsy. And then this is the summary of complications, and the, for the consent, as I discussed with Dr. Mohammed Al-Hadidi, uh, we should uh, speak about complications, but in a very logic manner and in a very simple manner. Because if I can say, I can go to the patient and I find the biopsy is mandatory and then uh, I, I want him just to refuse the biopsy, I can speak to him by a language that he refuses the biopsy. So I should be fair. The complication, the instance of complications, so on, so on, so. And I'm going to do my best to reduce the risk of complications. So we have risk of hematuria, maybe very mild because this is a biopsy. The subcapsular bleeding, retroperitoneal bleeding, less a percentage, AV fistula formations. So I go to the complications one by one because the patient should sign at the end or and accepting this maneuver with complications, even uh, respecting the medical, legal, and the law. Uh, and then uh, we should take care and follow the standard precautions to reduce the complications. So CBC is mandatory, coagulation profile, INR, bleeding time if creatinine is high. All these are uh, uh, needless to say because it's mandatory and the standard of care for doing a biopsy. And then uh, discussing with the, uh, the, uh, the person who will do the biopsy about the uh, safe technique as he can. So needle gauge and the number of needle passes to be minimized. If the patient is an antiplatelet treatment, he should be very careful 
for doing a biopsy in extremes of age. So the higher the serum creatinine, the higher risk of bleeding. The blood pressure should be controlled before the biopsy. All these should be put in mind. And at the end of the day, after discussing all these points and the precaution, the patient may say, I'm going to do, I'm agreeing to doing the biopsy or refusing biopsy. And I think the most critical ethical issue, if, I, if we conduct a study and the study is based on biopsy, this is a research, how to take informed consent for doing invasive maneuver and the, the main aim of invasive maneuver is to do research. Suppose that we want to prove uh, a non-invasive test in urine or blood is uh, efficient to detect renal fibrosis. So we should compare the results of this test to renal biopsies. And then we we'll go to the patient to take a consent. The, then one of the important question, what is the aim of this biopsy? Uh, and then I, I cannot say to him, this is for your treatment or your prognosis. So it needs another language and the transparency. So I can, uh, uh, because this was a, one of the stations that we put in the medical exam at Faculty of Medicine, how to take by, uh, informa informed consent for biopsy for the purposes of research. And we both questions to the role player, am I going to die? So, uh, and then we witness how physician reply to this uh, shocky question, how to convince uh, a person to do biopsy for the sake of research. So we can answer, yes, this biopsy may not directly lead to your benefit, but you'll benefit the society if we find an invasive test that will replace this invasive maneuver, maneuver. So your participation in research may be very valuable to all humanity. And at the end of the day, you can find the patient agreeing or refusing, and he has 100% the right to refuse or to uh, giving consent. One of the very important issue, especially when we deal with chronic disease, is how to break bad news. What is meant by bad news? Uh, this, this is a situation, uh, the, the, any news that seriously and adversely changes the patient's view for future. And the, uh, the bad news degree is uh, uh, assessed or dictated or determined by the gap, the gap of patient's expectations and the reality of patient's condition. This is a very uh, important. So if I have a young lady who had a past history of breast cancer that was treated efficiently in the past and now for example, she is working as medical secretary and writing on the computer and then coming complaining of backache. And she comes to me, uh, I have a backache. And what is your expectation? What, uh, I, I'm thinking that because I am working on the computer for all the time. So she, the, in this scenario, there is a big gap between his expectation because you find in radiology metastasis from the past from the treated cancer and the cancer uh, may. So the, how to conduct this interview? How to tell her that it is not back ache because of the, uh, the spine from the pos position, it is because of metastasis. So it is, it is very important and very disastrous bad news. How bad according to the expectation? So this is the gap of expectation determines the severity of bad news. And the expectation is very different and completely different from a person to person. So you can come to me, you have diabetes. I say to you, it's okay. So how uh, diabetes, uh, all, all, I, I know many people who have diabetes is not uh, an issue. And you can say to another person, you have diabetes, then he has a syncope because just informed that he is diabetic. So this is why we should be very sensitive and assessing the patient's uh, perception for the bad news. If we do it badly, this is our task. If we conduct the, the, the bad news breaking in a badly way, the patients or family members, uh, because here in the, this is one of the different issues in the Eastern in Egypt, in comparison to Western community here, the families are involved so much 
in the treatment of, for, for competent adults because this is our culture. So uh, this will both the patients and the family member uh, in, a, in a, a situation that they may never forgive us. So if we do it badly, we'll, we will not be forgiven for this badly maneuver. But if we do it well, they may never forget us. So this is the, the complete difference between how the smart uh, is the physician and this will be reflected about satisfaction. It seems that we need to be trained, all of us from the starting point, from the medical student, the residents, and for all ages, because as you see in this study, delivering bad news, there is a defect in this issue. There are many systems how to uh, conduct uh, a session for breaking bad news. And I like this uh, mood spikes that was used in telling about cancer because it includes steps like establishing an environment and settings to be very careful, sensitive with the patient, not telling a patient that you have a cancer while I'm very busy in telephone and laughing in the telephone with my friend. It is non-professional at, at all. So the environment and setting and to assist the patient perception by asking him even open-minded, open-ended question, and then try to conduct the knowledge piece by piece. And sometimes we conduct the bad news uh, breaking in, in subsequent sessions, according to the tolerance of the patients. One of the most important points is the empathetic way. Empathy is a drug, and we should learn it. We try to learn it day by day. And at the end, of the breaking bad news, we uh, put a strategy and a summarize. So this is the uh, spikes attitude. I like this uh, letter in the JAMA because this doctor, uh, I think he was a transplant surgeon in, in, in Japan and they moved to the United States. And the United States, he worked as a palliative medicine physician. So organ transplant surgeon, this is, uh, I find it very satisfactory. And then moving to till the patient for palliative care, it is very disappointing. But I like the, this two pages because he wrote a very philosophical statements. He uh, uh, compared the working in a surgery and organ transplantation to conducting palliative care. So he mentioned that during surgery, he reviewed the operation the night before surgery. And then during the surgery, if there is any mishap, he can invite one of his colleagues or seniors to help him in this uh, operation. That's it. But he, when he moved to the United States, dealing with frustrated patient and angry family, he was very stuck. And he, he started to think how to proceed. And after becoming trained and make it as his life, how to deal with patients and angry, angry patients and the family, he likes this job. And at the end of his writing, he said that treating palliative care is more humanity, more hum uh, having more humanity than even doing surgery. So this is as Dr. Tudora mentioned, humanity. Uh, uh, and our job is to deal with the patient to lessen and de decrease his suffering. Whatever the outcome, whatever the, the, the speciality that we are working, we are working with our patients to decrease their suffering. I remember one of my seniors statement that he said, Hussein, we have the salaries to, uh, to help the patient to tolerate their sufferings. This is our the primary job in dealing with chronic uh, diseases in general. So the patient, uh, from the philosophical points of view, needs this mnemonic, I care. I means information. We should tell them information, but with compassion, in a very nice, smart way, not to be harsh, and positive attitude. We are not, we are not this is not confrontation. We are dealing as we are dealing, uh, we are uh, 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 we are patients. Responsive, to be very responsive and rapid responsive and the expertise is very crucial. And I like this uh, quotation 
all I ever wanted was to reach out and touch another human, uh, not by my hand, but with my heart. This is very important. And I apply the most pleasing let five letter word, Dr. Hadidi. Do you know what is meant by the five letter word, the most pleasing? What's your expectation? Uh, I think the most, the, the most pleasing five letter word is about the uh, constant. It is just funny, but because uh, you'll find it in this, uh, in this slide, smile. When we do a clinic around on dialysis, and you are a senior, we, we have a re a residents and a senior residents and the registrar and a PhD degree. And so at the end of the day, if, if, if you are a senior person and uh, making around in dialysis patients, the patient is just like, the patient likes to just to see your face smiling attentive to him and listening to him, even if you don't do anything. This is why I do survey with uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Uh, Professor Donia, here at the Dallas unit. Uh, we ask the patients, do you find the presence of senior doctors at hand is important for you? We don't do anything extra. The answer was yes, your presence creates a trust in the system. Your presence in the, in the, uh, in the Dallas unit uh, give us the feeling of uh, security. So your presence, even if you don't do anything, is very crucial for us. This is why a smile is important. And this is an example of the bad news that we, every day we face. So this is an example of uh, the bad news so this is 22 year old asymptomatic male who comes just for checkup. And during the checkup, we find the chronic end stage chronic kidney disease, small kidneys, creatine five, and we need to start the preparation for dialysis or transplantation. This is a person who is young age and coming just for checkup. If we apply the definition of breaking bad news, it is very stormy bad news and shocky because we, uh, the, we are very far from the patient's expectation. He just comes for checkup. Another uh, scenario, 22-year-old female patient. She has active lupus nephritis, proteinuria 10 gram, creatine is high, and the uh, three milligram per deciliter and maintained on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, statin, steroids, and MMF. So the lupus nephritis is, is very active disease and she was treated with drugs and she wants to start his life and the, here the the problem is she is engaged and thinking of marriage how to discuss with her to postpone marriage or to tell the uh, the man about the problem that she has and the problems of thinking of pregnancy even if he agrees about her situation how to think of delaying pregnancy in this scenario and if she decided to be pregnant later on, she, will, she should stop valuable medications and ultimately renal failure and even infertility will occur. So this is a very uh, problematic case. Needs a high degree of expertise in how to conduct this uh, interview. Another, uh, this, I, I witnessed this case when I was a resident. And I learned it a lot from this case. This is a 32-year-old lady who delivered her first baby. Uh, uh, her husband was abroad working in, uh, the, in the Gulf. And then she born a, a very nice baby. Uh, he is obese, Edematous. And then the photo, she had a photograph for the baby and, uh, and sent it to her husband. The husband was very happy because he has this very nice but at the end of the day, he is six months, edematous, creating 1.2. So this is the nephrotic syndrome, renal failure in this baby, and the biopsy showed congenital nephrotic syndrome. The outcome of this case is to do bilateral nephrectomy, starting between dialysis until uh, he become fit for transplantation, mortality is very high. How to tell this uh, very young lady about this one? So I told her, this is, you are still young, and the prognosis of this child is very bad. And then she asked me a question. 
and the, 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 if if I if I have future pregnancy, subsequent pregnancies, if this will be the situation. So at this point of time, I said to her, yes, maybe. <laughs> so she, she was in a very catastrophic situation. So this is not at all the smart way of conducting bad news. So uh, uh, in this scenario, we, can, we should build a hope. At a 22-year-old male patient with accidental discovery uh, before marriage, this is the same. So when we deal, with our cases, with, with these very problematic issues from the ethical point of view, we should always telling the truth, but in a very compassionate way, we should uh, 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 dissect the information into small pieces, multiple sessions, not necessarily to be in one session, except if the patient knows his well, uh, state well and the coming asking, so this is a completely different. So open-ended question, can help us to know our patients. Always build a hope. I think uh, 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 I remember one of this, uh, the writing of one of the very famous professors in psychiatry in Egypt, I think a Professor Akasha, wrote a very nice in the newspapers, uh, what is the secret of our happiness? Is it in our position, in the money, whatever? The, and at the end of the, his analysis, he mentioned the happiness is in building hope. So how to live without hope? So even if we are dealing with a patient who has a gloomy prognosis, uh, we try to say to him, yes, there is a big problem, but we are hoping for uh, so and so and so. Regarding professionalism, this is a very interesting and very important. Uh, always, uh, I like the professional one in any profession. The professionalism means, as you see in this uh, definition, uh, is a belief uh, system in which a group members, professionals declare or profess to each other and the public that share the competency standards and the ethical values they promise to uphold in their work and what the public and the individual patients can and should expect from medical professionals. And I think uh, uh, and I, I have Dr. Tudora here. I have my statement why, uh, when I uh, teach the students about clinical examination. I have my own statement. Clinical examination is bi directional. Was meant bi directional. I examine the patient and the patient examine me. So the professional persons, the, 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 uh, when we deal with patients, patients are very smart. When I am a professional, he, he will know by heart that I am professional. When I'm, at, I'm not a professional one, even if I do tricks, he will know that I am not a professional. So the patients are very smart. Professionalism is not a sportsmanship. If you don't succeed, you want to be in your profession for long. In our society, it is not about good or bad. It's about who is on top. So we should put in mind to improve ourselves. And I, I think all these definitions are uh, straightforward. Uh, uh, the professionalism can foster common identity. Professionalism incorporates re coexisting commitments to patients, the profession, and the wider community. Professionalism involves three core skills, good clinical skill, communication skills, and good management and leadership skills. Uh, professionalism is not an external shield of defense. To be effective, it has, no, it has to be seen as highly desirable core that provides resilience and job satisfaction. And from this definition, profession is characterized by a specialized body of knowledge that is, uh, its members must teach and expand by a code of ethics and the duty of service that in medicine puts patients care above self-interest and by the privilege of self-regulation granted by society. Physicians must individually and collectively fulfill the duties of profession. And uh, this is the examples of linking professional values to specific behaviors, including responsibility, maturity, communication skills, and respect, and you can find the behavior concomitant to each value. So for example, uh, for uh, respect, maintains the patient confidentiality, 
uh, is sensitive to the physician and emotional need is not biased or discriminatory. The 5R strategy is uh, f uh, fulfilling reflection, respect, regard, relevance, and resiliency. All these to put in mind. And this is the very nice book uh, about the guide to professional conduct and the ethics. I uh, advise all myself and all colleagues to read uh, the, because it's very, very uh, simple and includes many ethical points. So the pillars of professionalism are three Bs, partnership, practice, and performance. So these are the three pillars uh, of uh, professionalism, partnership, practice, and performance. And I'm going to discuss them in just enumerating their uh, com uh, composition. So for partnership, we should build the trust. Trust with, with, with patients and trust in the system is very crucial uh, for the uh, success of healthy care system. Patient-centered care. In the past, medicine was concentrated on doctor and then centered on the disease and currently centered on the patient. So the patient is in the heart of the uh, healthy care system and all health care system is uh, for the sake of the patients. We are working together so with our colleagues in the same specialty and other specialties with uh, health care, other health care providers. Uh, so we should learn how to work in a team. Uh, advocacy to speak uh, to the side of the patient, always defending the patient and dealing with the patient with good communication. So these are the principles of partnership. One of, I think one of the important issue, if the patient insisted to be discharged against the medical advice, what are the ethical here? Could we speak to him in a very rough way? Yes, please sign for me that you want to be discharged against medical advice, and that's all, we don't like to see you again. It is not like this. There are ethics for the patient who wants to be discharged against medical advice. Yes, uh, we are sorry that you insisted to be discharged, but we will keep our care to you. This is the plan of management in the future, so and so. And not just, if you don't like us, we don't like you, goodbye. <laughs> Dr. Halawa? No, I agree, totally agree. Actually explaining the, you know, the consequences of early discharge, number one, number two, to reassure him that we'll continue looking after him. Number three, which is more important to document in the notes that he uh, self-discharged. Because, you know, this is, uh, you know, for for medical part of the professionalism as well. Yes. To protect against any legal action. Could happen yes. because, you know, if he's self-discharging, um, you know, he might uh, subject to a lot of complications. So yes. we, and, you know, all the, our discussion should be documented in the notes as well. Dr. Tudora? Um, yes, thank you. I, um, I have here a few remarks okay uh, again Please. i like you know i like the ethics always to be checked in a practice you know what happens and um you mentioned the right to second opinion yes and you mentioned the patient center you know which which are the core values of medical ethics you know however there was a case in the uk and i think professor halawa might might, might know about that um, when a child with a brain tumor was held in the hospital in the UK and his father, if I'm ethnic minority, which is a very interesting issue here, I think, um, wanted to have a second opinion and the treatment, I think in the Czech Republic, involving a proton beam therapy. Um, so this um, uh, father and subsequently the child who was the patient, was not allowed to be discharged from the hospital. And the father had to steal his own child from the hospital and to travel abroad. And of course, it was an Interpol operation and they caught them in Spain, I think. And um, it, it was absolutely awful. However, in the end, he managed to, you know, with, with good lawyers, I think, 
he managed to have the child uh, treated with protonbin therapy in the Czech Republic and the child recovered. While in the UK, they didn't, they would not apply, they would not apply this, this therapy by the time it was not available, I think it was five or six years ago. So from my point of view, um, here, the, the right to second opinion was not allowed. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see the conflict between, you know, the, the parent rights and the consent and all, all the, there are lots, lots of ethical problems. Um, and for me, you know, as an ethnic minority patient myself, I can tell you that if I go to my GP dress as I'm dressed to walk my dog, I get one type of treatment and attention. If I get dressed like going to medical school and teaching, I get totally different outcomes. Just a remark. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Dr. Halawa, do you want to... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Tidora, how do you explain this difference in treatment? Because your appearance has changed. Um, it's, it's very interesting, you know, they, they make assumptions. Sometimes the GPs, uh, they make assumptions based on your appearance regarding your health literacy, understanding, um, and, uh, you know, your possibility to accept. So they, the thing is, and I don't blame it on, on them, you know, they have eight minutes per patient and there is a, a lack of resources and so on. And they want to get rid of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I had my, my, um, uh, blood pressure went to the roof. Uh, I was feeling very bad. I had every evening, for example, nose bleeding and I couldn't get upstairs without having nose bleedings and normally being someone with a very low blood pressure, you know, my, my blood pressure values, although they were pre, you know, in a chart, they were pre dangerous level they are still very high for myself and i knew i i knew that i i have a problem you know um i went to a new gp so someone who didn't know me because was, i was new here in liverpool um and uh, she looked at me said your blood pressure is normal so she didn't listen to what i said to her uh, and she gave me a nasal cream with antibiotics <laughs> I said, but you know, it's, and it's like, you know, I, it is some, she gave me something, you know, to get rid of me, yeah. but I knew to have bleeding, you know, from an infected, a bacterial infection from my nose, my nose should be like a tomato, you know, <laughs> so that made, it made no sense for me. Uh, if now when I go to a new GP, I tell them that <laughs> if they ask me where I work, I, I, I work at School of Medicine. And then suddenly change. They, they touch me. <laughs> they, they, I get some referral, you know. Uh, I was even told, you know, I have kidney stones myself. And I went to a GP and I said, look, I had kidney stones documented in Romania and so on. And I want to, to check because I have pain again. And I want to check if there are no father building up because I used to have a, a medicine to um, destroy them. Uh, and I was, she looked at me and said, oh, you are so young, go back home and drink some tea. <laughs> hmm. So I might be in your list. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very, but this is, as you said, there are, are problems of professionalism, there are problems of medical communication. And there is, there is the pressure and the lack of resources as well. Very nice. I, I thank you very much for these valuable comments from uh, Dr. Todora and Dr. Halal. So the patient-centered approach includes a lot of issues. How to speak to patients. Uh, and the, if you look here, the components, exploring health disease and illness experience. And this is a brief description. I'm not going to read the slides, but these are the components. Always we are interested in involving the patient in the care, understanding the whole person, finding common ground, enhancing the patient clinical relationship and building trust. Because building trust between patient and doctor is fundamental for the healthcare system. If you don't trust your doctor, you don't trust all healthcare system. So this is very important how to deal with the patients. And for clinical reasoning, we will find shared decision making, how to share decision, to speak to the patient, to put him in the focus, and this will uh, lead the patient to be very satisfied at the end of the day. 
as Dr. Tudora mentioned, the proper communication is essential. And for proper, communic proper communication, I, I have a statement as well. A good doctor is a good communicator, and we can say a good actor. If I am in the duty, and even if I, I because we treat patients always, we know they, them very much because we deal with chronic patients. Even if I know this is, the, this, this is a patient with disruptive behavior and is a difficult patient, we should learn how to be actor, good actor, to dealing with him with a nice and compassion way to absorb him as we can. To, and this is to the contrary, how to deal with disruptive behavior. And because this is another scenario, we can speak it, about it in another presentation. If we are in dialysis and then we have a patient who commits suicide, commits crime with the system, with the nurse, how to deal with this patient, I'm, I'm leaving this topic to another session. So how to communicate? We have uh, principally four uh, communication skills, either verbal, Listening, uh, 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 even listening, only listening is a very nice way. Sometimes uh, uh, if the patient asks me, is it cancer? And then I stop speaking. Then the answer is yes, it's cancer. But it will be more humane to stop speaking rather than saying, yes, it's cancer. By the by, by sharp and harsh way. Re is it renal failure in this stage? Yes, it's in the stage. If, but if I stop speaking, just listening and stop speaking, the patient will understand this is in the stage kidney disease. So we should know our patients. Nonverbal language, it is the most common way for communication. So it includes facial expression, gestures, postures, body movements, smile and the touch. We shouldn't touch the person because it is invasion. And uh, for the professional touch, it, it should be like here in non-sensitive area of the body, but in a temporary way. Keeping eye to eye contact, using the voice, all these are uh, mandatory. And I think this is, this is one of our um, uh, biggest, uh, our star, superstars, Zach Rustom, in the past. I think this, is, this appearance is not at all compassion way. Uh, to deal with the patient by this uh, uh, phase. Or if the patient come uh, uh, to me saying, what, uh, what's meant by fistula? I say to him, fistula, fistula, <laughs> just to move, <laughs> for, to get rid of the patient. Just, this, by this way, when I do anger like this, the patient will go away. And uh, it is unethical at all. We should spend time with the patient to uh, let him satisfy. So communication is the human connection, is the key to uh, everything successful, to personal and career success. Uh, regarding the second pillar of professionalism, which is practice, care, caring, and it is uh, essential to care when we treat our patients, to take care of the patient and to take care of ourselves, to, uh, to uh, deal with all his belongs in confidential way. I can tell you a story was, was one of my relatives. When I visited him while he is dying, I informed his brother, please deal with him in a nice way, he is dying. What happened? He come to him and, and take his agreement, even if that is not aware, to have his money and his property. So we should be careful about the confidentiality because it puts us under medical legal. Integrity of the care, self-caring of the patients and ourselves. and uh, for, for the COVID-19, we learn how to uh, have the protective equipment, even it can uh, make a big barrier with, conduct, with uh, dealing with the patients, uh, how to improve practice using resources. And if there is a conflict of interest, uh, uh, we should be smart how to deal with in the presence of conflict of interest. Like if I am uh, chairing an, an investment in company that has certain products or I'm, I have a deal by way or another with companies, this should be clear and shouldn't affect my prescription. And if it is uh, is mandatory, I should explain to the patient, this is, I, am, I have a, a work with this company promoting a patient's safety is mandatory 
and this is uh, uh, the patient safety from A to Z. I'm not going to read them, but the philosophy is uh, we are human being, and human is to err. So, but the uh, from the quality assurance of healthcare system, if we do any error, we should be capable to correct it, not to repeat it, and we should target zeroing to put zero error at the target. So always we reduce our way of error instead of creating an environment of blame because blaming in the environment lead to uh, non-trust and lead to angry and it is non-professional at all. And I think all these points are very crucial and I think the slide can be uh, fixed and uh, to read every statement. When we deal with the patients, we have the heart and the brain. Heart means emotions to do something to the patient. But I like always uh, to support the brain, brain to think in depth. Uh, is, it, uh, is this an emotional rushing attitude? Because we can uh, prescribe invasive or com uh, t uh, uh, treatment with a lot of complications, as Professor Halawa uh, always would discuss with him evidence-based management, even if it's not level A, but it should be an evidence, not just to, to do an experiment uh, with the patient. So always uh, safety of the patient is in the priority and should be prioritized. Regarding performance domains, we have competency. And the competency means to work on an evidence. And as I mentioned, it is not necessarily to be level A evidence, but we should have an evidence and keep up to date informations. And even if we read guidelines, we should review its date and to update ourselves in the skills. We shouldn't do any skills while we are not trained well or lack of training on these skills because it is uh, unethical at, at all. Uh, from the competency points is to know how to deal, how to uh, find, find a solution for the patient. Uh, and from the competence, you want to refer the patients to other colleagues. Reflective practice, and always I like this term from Professor Halawa, reflection. Reflection, this is the, the, this is the maturity. So to audit and the, uh, and the outcome data and to correct, uh, to correct ourselves. Acting as a role model, I think this is, this is very important because we can learn others by our attitude, not by our words. Teaching and training medical students again and again and again. Physician means teacher, either teaching uh, our colleagues or the patients. And then everything can be evaluated. Without evaluation, uh, there will be no competency. And this is a smart way because there is a scale either outstanding above accepted standards, meeting acceptable standards, or below accept acceptable standards. So the minimum, and this is, as Dr. Tudora mentioned, the law is the, minimally, is the minimal standard. The ethic is, is the outstanding. So we should build ourselves toward the top, not the bottom. Physician should be above this standard, not below the acceptable standard. And this is how the checklist for evaluating every domain uh, by putting checklist at the end of the day, everything can be evaluated. So if we look at professionalism as a building, these are the pillars, partnership, practice, and the performance. Uh, I, I like to hear from you, uh, Professor Hala and, and Dr. Todora, about uh, this point of professionalism after one or two slides. So the fundamental principles of uh, professionalism include primacy of the patient well-being, patient's autonomy and social justice, the commitments, competence, honesty, confidentiality, appropriate relationship with patients, improving the quality of health care, improving the accessible to health care, fair distribution of finite resources, scientific knowledge, conflict of interest, trust, and the management and responsibilities. And then to build the uh, uh, leadership. And then the poor performance as defined in the Medical Practitioners Act 
means a failure by the practitioner to meet the standards of competence. So we should be aware of that. This has been interpreted by Supreme Court to mean serious failure. And I want to end the professionalism by this slide. Uh, we have accountability uh, in Arabic means al masuliya and empowerment in Arabic means at to be able. So accountability minus empowerment equal blame. Empowerment minus accountability means low performance. If we combine accountability, responsibility, and the power, as Dr. Tudora mentioned, sometimes we want to do the best, but the resources are lacking. So empowerment plus accountability means the uh, best performance. At the end of the professionalism, does professionalism means perfectionism? The answer is there is a complete difference between professionalism and the uh, perfectionism. Always uh, I'm seeking for improving myself. And I don't like the way of perfectionistic people because they lost time. So uh, as I mentioned, a human being is a person who makes mistakes, but to learn from mistakes, not to repeat it, and not to be disastrous mistakes, this is why as physician we should be trained well. I want to hear from you, Dr. Tudora and the Professor Halawa. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Hussein, you know, for this interesting talk. Um, I would like to comment on two points. Number one, the shared opinion. You mentioned shared opinion with the patient. Yes. Number one, uh, you know, there is a professional uh, prof uh, professionalism plays an important role here. You know, and have to we have to explain to the patient in a very simple terms, rather than uh, letting yes. it drown in a very complex. To medical terminology and we have to give him the options and give him the percentage of success of each option and this is part of the informed consent the informed consent should be the yeah, patient should be informed by all aspects of the procedure and the complications as well so uh, I've, I've been witnessed uh, I've witnessed actually you know a uh, few concerns where using medical terms, very complex medical terms, and you can tell clearly that the physician was not keen to listen. It was expected yes or no answer, which is definitely this is not uh, uh, professional. Um, also, don't forget your patient is not a doctor, so you don't need to give him you know, uh, the nitty gritty of evidence and the trials and all sort of randomized control, whatever. No, but you have to pass it to him in a very simple term. And you have to have numbers, figures and numbers to support your view. And the figures and numbers, it would be better to be your numbers, you know, if you have audit, or the trust number, or the hospital number, or the international number, with proper, uh, with proper reference. You know, say international guidelines said that, or the hospital guidelines showed that, or my, uh, you know, my figures and numbers, my audit showed that. Um, this is number one. Number two, do you know in uh, NHS UK, most of the com complaints, more than 75 of the complaints, are due to the poor communication between the, you know, the, the, the doctors and the patients. There's a misunderstanding you know, among uh, very, you know, uh, health professional that these patients are seeking money or seeking compensation. No, they're not seeking compensation. That what they are seeking for, seeking for somebody to listen to them. You haven't listened to them in the first place. Busy clinic, 80 patients to be seen and you are on your own, rushing, 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 rushing. You didn't wait for the patient to ask questions and you didn't have patience and you didn't have time uh, uh, to give them answer. Most likely this will end up by a complaint. And as I mentioned later on, 70, more than 70% of the complaints end by, by you listening to them again. So uh, communication is a major issue in, in, in our uh, you know, uh, medical community. And it has to be addressed 
you know, and it has to be given a priority with the patient. In our clinic, we used to be given uh, 20 minutes for new patients and 10 minutes for follow-up. This is purely administrative, which is not quite right because sometimes the follow-up patients have more questions. You know, so basically, it shouldn't be this time should be shouldn't be restrictive. But the patient who will end the consultation is in his hand rather than your hand. Uh, and that's it. Really, this is uh, these are my comments. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Halawa, and I agree with you 100%. And I asked it here uh, we, 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 from Saudi Arabia, we had uh, Professor Ayman Karkar, who uh, have with us presentation at Urogia and Nefro Center. And I asked him, please speak to us about medical legal issues in Saudi Arabia. He mentioned that 95% of the complaints uh, are due to uh, failure of communications. And in, in certain occasion, uh, the patients uh, raise a complaint about many doctors and many person and excluded only one person. And when uh, Professor Karkar examined the file, he found that this is the only one who did mistakes from the medical point of view. But he was talented in uh, containing the patient by communication. So we don't want to be liars, but we, we want to be uh, to combine the skills knowledge, skills, and attitude together in doing communication. I agree with you about the complications and, the, and to telling the patient, for example, for renal biopsy, when we ask, are asked, is there a risk of death because of doing renal biopsy? The answer is like this, because there is in the literature a report of death. If I say it is impossible to die from a biopsy, this is not a professional way. But I say from the literature, it is one out of 10,000 cases, there is a possibility to, for the patient to die from doing a biopsy. But here in our center, I, uh, since more than uh, 30 year uh, witnessing, I didn't find any mortality. So I told him about the international literature and I told him, I told, I told him about uh, the experience of the place he is in. This will create support and, uh, and to, for the consent to be very professional. Dr. Tudora? Um, thank you very much. I, I like a lot how you integrated, you know, all the ethical values we mentioned before into uh, the three pillars of professionalism. And I totally agree with you. With, I don't have anything to add, you know, the, the confidentiality, the autonomy, everything. Um, I have a few, a few problems with autonomy. So I work, um, now, um, I stopped it a year ago because we moved place. I worked as a medical interpreter, uh, helping ethnic minority patients to communicate in clinical practice uh, when, when they don't have enough English uh, or, you know, they don't know at all English. And um, I came across a very, you know, very wide range of problems uh, regarding to, to communication. But I must say, you know, from my experience, 80% of the clinicians I work with, they're excellent in communication, but you always have, you know, exception. Um, the communication, uh, and I totally agree with Professor Halawa here, it's, it's absolutely crucial for building trust. And I think um, regarding, you know, the number of complaints he mentioned, if you do not manage to build trust with the patient, then you expose yourself, you know, to a distrustful relationship and then things goes wrong, then they will, they will complain. So I think the, the meaning of communication, you know, in terms of building trust is, is absolutely crucial. And I like very much what you said about this double examination, which to be honest, I didn't hear about it so far. Uh, in you know talking to the medical students and so on, but I think it's absolutely essential. And I can I can give you again an example uh, from my life. So my son had a, um, a blockage in um, a croup, so he couldn't breathe at night time, and was really he was small, like five years, really really scary. Called the ambulance, the paramedics were there in no time. And they give him something, a medicine to relax, to help him breathe. And they told me the next day you go to the family doctor to have a second dosis of that. I don't remember the name of the medicine. 
So what I did, so that because you have a young child, uh, he had problems with breathing and so on. I went to the GP. I said, look, the paramedics came. I had a, a piece of paper from them and they said to come to you and to have a second dose of this medicine. So what the GP did, she opened the computer and put in Google the name of the medicine, took the first entry, you know, the first results coming back and told me, ah, we don't do that. One dose is enough. Oh. So now, you know, from my point of view, I said, look, I, you know, if the same doctor would open a book from one of the books there and would look there and, you know, ask me a few questions and said, uh, actually, I think it's not necessary based on evidence, as uh, Dr. Halawa said, uh, I don't have reason to believe that. But, you know, I was in a situation that a suffocated child was helped by the paramedics, so I trusted their professionalism. And then I went to a GP who told, based on Google, you know, a, a research tool which is not very sophisticated, was not uh, a medical research engine, was nothing like this. And, you know, I just, it's an example of how easy you can lose trust because the patient is examining you, as you said, in the same time. So that's like, you know, the, the importance of communication and, and trust in ethical relationships. I think the issue of autonomy is expanding every day. Uh, yesterday, I read an article about uh, the United States uh, detaining unit. If there is a security uh, to attend with the detained person, detainee, uh, while he is uh, exa uh, um, uh, exposed to clinical examination, is it uh, breaching for the autonomy? And there is a, a very big discussion about this point. So uh, a lot of issue. but the trend is toward to uh, improve the relationship with the patients, keeping uh, his values in the priority. Uh, th I think it will build the trust as uh, Professor Halawa and Dr. Tudora mentioned. And very rapidly uh, for uh, the, our specialty in nephrology, uh, I start with, the, with this slide, and I think Dr. Halawa will like it. Uh, this is the uh, number of randomized clinical trial done in many specialties all through the last uh, many decades, as you see, from 1966 until the current era for all these. As you see here, we are here. We are either a red uh, circle or squares, blue squares, uh, nephrology or expanded. Expanded kidney means dialysis and transplantation. So the number of randomized clinical trials done in nephrology, dialysis and transplantation are in the bottom of all the specialities. As you see, the nervous system and the cardiovascular system, a lot of randomized clinical trials. I bought this because we need to enhance the research, but at the same moment, we shouldn't forget the principles of ethics when we do research. Uh, and I'm not going to discuss the ethics of research anymore. Uh, for dialysis purposes, as you see here, rise. I think all the, every word in this slide, respect, integrity, stewardship, ex excellence, shows every word is a reflection of ethics. Even from the ethical point of view nowadays, uh, uh, that uh, it's included in the key performance indicator, how to do green maneuvers. Green dialysis means that dialysis is a friend to the environment. How to reduce the burden of the environment by doing dialysis, how to, how to save water, electricity, and how to use water in a proper way. So a lot of issues are added to the practice and the physicians and doctors should be updated by these points. For example, if we apply the principle of green dialysis by saving water, this uh, can help a lot in saving water instead of the loss of water with RO rejected water, we can use it again by improving the machine. So we can use it. So by this way, we can preserve 30% or 50% of the lost water, or even for rejected water, instead of, to, of going to the drain directly, we can use the rejected water into uh, washing and all other uh, utilities. One of the very important issue in dialysis from the ethical point of view, the critical decision to do dialysis or not. For, for example, K 
cancer patient. This was a session during the, uh, uh, the Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation Conference. Doing dialysis, to do dialysis or not for the patient with metastasis, and it was presented elegantly by my colleague, Professor Ahmed Qureh. Uh, and uh, there is a mechanism. Again, sharing decision. We should evaluate the patient. Uh, is there any benefit from doing dialysis? Or it is futile treatment for a patient with metastasis, a lot of comorbidity, and we know that he is ultimately will die. So I, the shared decision, the proper communication, I think, is the best way to dealing with this patient. Uh, and by sharing decision, it's, it seems like this way is to have our way uh, to build a trust and doing a professional job. But it's very, very problematic issue and it depends upon the patients. Another important crucial decision in dialysis, when to stop dialysis or to withdraw dialysis. If we have demented person, do we agree to, the, to stop dialysis? If the patient decided to stop dialysis, what to do with him? If the patient come to dialysis late, do, do we shorten the session? All these are ethical points, and I think it needs a nephrology uh, seminar. Regarding transplantation, Professor Halau is interested by transplantation, and I am very happy and pleased to work in a theology and nephrology center in Mansoura University because under uh, the, the Professor Gunaim. Professor Gunaim is the leader of the center and the founder of the center. He established transplantation program on ethical basis, and this is one of the most important issues. We learn it how to deal with in an ethical way. Uh, for you, Dr. Tudora, 95% of our transplant are life-related. Why life-related? Is uh, because of ethics. If there is no problem, if, if there is no ethical constraints, I select as from the knowledge and from the experience unrelated transplantation. But why we are against unrelated except for reason, this is because of ethics. Because we know the uh, way of commercialism and the money and, the, and the organ sale and all these are prohibited. So this is the advantage of working with the, an ethical man. So he started the journey of transplantation on 1976. And the last year, he, uh, we witnessed we, uh, this celebration of completion of 3,000 live donor kidney transplantation in uh, urology and fluorescent, at urology and fluorescent center. And the privilege of this center is the ethical practice and the following up transplant patients and donor as well. We have donor clinic uh, follow up and the donor are dealt with as hero and champions. And this is a team, including Professor Ghanim, Professor Sobh, my professors, and all the team, Professor Ayman, the current chief of the unit, and all my professors and colleagues. The number of transplant that we have uh, from March 1976 until uh, March 11, because unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we stopped live donor kidney transplantation program since 11th of March. I, I'm, I'm sure that if the coronavirus will continue, we'll sit together, uh, as, we dis as I discussed with Professor Halawa yesterday, to find a way to uh, restart again in a very careful manner. Regarding the ethics, a lot of ethics are there for donors, uh, uh, including the same principles of ethics. And here, for live donor, we have an added value for altruism. What is meant by altruism? This is in Arabic, al ithar and in English, selfless gift to others without expectation of remuneration. In Arabic, ma fish ta'weed. Uh, so uh, altruism, autonom autonomy, beneficence, dignity, do no harm, all these are okay. But what is added as well, reciprocity. What's meant by reciprocity in ethics of life donor, this is the typical example is the uh, bird donation. In bird donation, if we have these two couples, this donor can come to the second recipient and vice versa. So we can, uh, here we can ex exchange between couples. And I think it is completely ethical, but it needs, for example, in Egypt, we don't have the system yet because we need the law. So it is, and here is the difference between ethics and law. Uh, and to be ethical, the two couples should be transplanted simultaneous. 
and maybe in three pairs or even one altruistic donor can open a chain. So, the, and this is a very nice. In the United States, according to their recent data, this is the number of bird donation, 1,000 per year. So this is a big part. So a lot of ethics are there in the bird donation, uh, exchange opportunities, legal, matching algorithms, the chain. Uh, so all these are points to be uh, in focus. And I like and I advocate the issue of bird donation. Regarding transplantation ethics, I think Istanbul Declaration of 2008 was uh, created, and it includes a lot of aspects about ethics of transplantation, including organ trafficking, organ sale, tourism. I'm not going to speak about this in details, but I'd like to speak about funny two points. Uh, one of them is if you have a case of older recipient and younger spousal donor. And in our system, we witness a, a problem like this. Because of the family bond, we may have a, a brother who comes to donate for his brother. And then he, when we speak to him in a very confidential way, he, uh, the donor says, I am afraid to be in danger, but I am oppressed by the society. How to do? So and when we deal with this issue in the past, we invented medical reason. Then we say to the donor, you are hypertensive. Uh, in, uh, in, in the system in the United States in the past, for this case, for example, they can order urine analysis while the lady is menstruating and saying there is hematuria, or collecting urine, uh, a half collection, and the clearance is 60 milli per minute. So, but Nowadays, from the ethical point of view, because ethics may, may change and evolve, they consider this unethical. And they put a statement. The system can refuse transplantation without giving reasoning, to just to raise this uh, point. Another very, uh, very sensitive in our community, if we find a donor, a father coming to donate uh, his daughter. And when we do two tithing, we find a zero match. Six by six mismatch Dr. Ahmed. Then this is not his, fa her father. So how to tell uh, the, the father that he is not the, so, uh, so this is a, great, a, a critical problem here in Egypt and in the Muslim countries. So this is an, an ethical issue. In this scenario, we can reject without saying uh, this point in a and in, in the clear manner. So a lot of ethics are there. Uh, uh, because of the time, I know that we are now late. I'm going uh, quickly. Uh, for research, uh, there, um, there may be a very nice seminar for research in the future, maybe. The five diamonds of research, I'm going uh, fast. A lot of specific bonds need a lot of time. Uh, how to build the emotional relationship with the patient. Is it ethical to build love and sexual contact with the patient? It is unethical, even from United States statements. How to keep boundaries of privacy? Uh, do we accept the gifts from the patients? And uh, it should be discussed. We should discuss with ourselves. If we have a patient who has um, low socioeconomic standard and they're coming to me, with a rose as a gift. It is okay to accept a rose, but not to accept money or eating or whatever. Uh, uh, the issue of uh, don't rest, state order need a time, futile treatment, financial arrangement, conflict of interest, a lot of issues are there. And uh, because of the time, um, I don't like to bother you by the detailed presentation. The last points I want to speak about the e-communications. In the, uh, because nowadays we use what's, even if I go to the emergency department, I find the resident uh, uh, sending the radiology to his senior, uh, what is your decision? So this is the way nowadays. Uh, is it safe to use the patient's um, uh, data on this e-communication? A lot of issues are there, but I, uh, it needs to be uh, reviewed. Even telemedicine, and this is one of the merits of coronavirus advantages is to establish telemedicine programs, to be obliged 
for telemedicine. And in the same moment, the, a lot of flyer, uh, flying are there in the era of COVID by uh, uh, tele-education. So I, I, I want just to go ahead. Uh, so the, the last, the, to close my presentation, as we're working as physician, we need to be scientists. We need to be skillful. We need uh, a good attitude. So to be successful at the end, to reach the stop uh, of the iceberg, we should go all these spirals, including the sacrification, hard work, exhaustion, try uh, learning. And I have my own statement. The doctor should learn from starting his life until his death, because this is the medicine is changing. And I have a special presentation about how medicine is a science of uncertainty by giving examples of even clinical management that is changed by evidence. So a lot, but uh, the assurance is if we like our job, we can do it. But because when we like our job, we will believe in our job. And the human performance, and I like this equation, Professor Halawa, human performance equals ability multiplied by willingness or belief or emotions. If I am able and I'm not interested, the performance will be very low. This is why when we invite presenters with us in meetings, we like the enthusiastic persons because enthusiasm is contagious. And the, the, uh, as I mentioned, and as I agree with Dr. Tudora, that ethics is the heart of medicine, is the heart of everything. And uh, I want just to end with this very nice uh, view from the garden of the Urology and Nephrology Center, Mansoura University. I like uh, the place and the center. And at the end, I thank you very much for your good, good, good attention and the presence of Dr. Tudora and Professor Halal with us today sure enriched this meeting and want to hear from you uh, before ending this session, Dr. Tudora and Professor Halal, please. I, I just say thank you very much for inviting me. I was, uh, I was really looking forward to it and was kind of unexpected, uh, but it's an excellent, excellent um, presentation and a, an extraordinary platform for discussion. And uh, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> And so I, I hope to, to be in dialogue any, any time soon. Uh, I work as an ethics expert for the European Commission also. And so I, um, I'm interested very much in research ethics. It's actually, you know, what I'm um, doing is my other job. <laughs> so this is an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, okay. so, this, so this is an invitation for you, Dr. Teodora, is Thank to you. give us a presentation through the Zoom <laughs> uh, at, at any time you <laughs> determine, and by the title of ethics, if you wanted to speak about any point of the ethics, I, we will be very glad. Thank you very much. You, Thank you. I would, I would think about them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you, if you make discussions, the case scenarios, this will be very nice uh, for all of us to learn from your experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Halawa, please. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm enjoyed, you know, this presentation. Um, but, you know, I have to commence here. Okay. Uh, just to tell you about our practice. Yes. Um, you know, if we have a donor, and we, of course the donor will see the donor separately from the recipient. And we felt uh, that the donor is being pushed uh, to donate. Yes. And sometimes they confess that, you know, I don't want to donate, but, you know, my, uh, my husband was pushing me. Mm. We'll pass a message that the donor is not suitable for the stop. Yes. Yeah. Without, you know, going to any details. You know, we, find, we examined the donor and we found him not suitable. And this is what the United States nowadays stated. Yeah. Because in the past they agreed about invented reasons, as we did. But... Uh, this, but as you know, Dr. Halawa, because you are, uh, you, you know, Egyptian uh, people, uh, it, it is a very difficult, difficult issue here. 
to say it because the, the, the patient can go ahead to another doctor saying he is very fit. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about fitness, we didn't talk about medicine, but we tell him, we tell them, you know, we found you don't, yeah. it's but the good thing about the system here, because the, you know, they, they are allowed for second opinion, but usually they trust us, you know, yes. because there's, all, you know, our transplant center always regional, the only one transplant And this is, excuse, excuse me for interruption, this is why in my state, they stopped the issue of inventing medical reason, because if the public knows that doctors invent reasons, this will uh, lead to distrust, mistrust of the system altogether. Uh, the, the second point, which is, you know, on uh, HLA matching, we've, we found that, you know, uh, the daughter or the son is not a real son or the father is not the, the true father. <laughs> uh, one of the immunologists, um, you know, presented in one of the immunology meetings 10 years ago, and he quoted, you know, something which is very funny. He said, every child has a mother. <laughs> very few of them. <laughs> this is, so, uh, this is again, Doctor Halal. This is the difference in culture from. Sure, of course. Community. Yeah, I'm coming to the point. Yes. Uh, but so it's quite common in our practice that you you realize that the donor is not related to the recipient. Although he's not the true father. Hmm. Before we do the LHA t uh, testing, we consent them, both of them. We'll do the HLA testing. Do you know the results and the real relationship, the true relationship or not? Most of them, lucky enough, said, no, I don't, I don't want to know. So, and this will relieve the pressure, you know, the yes. ethical dilemma on yes. us. Uh, and it, do, it does happen every now and then. And surprisingly, transplantation, you know, proceeds very well, and you can see the intimate relationship between the, the false father and the, and, the, and, the, and, and the child. So, you know, based on this consenting, we, 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 we don't do that. You know what I mean? We have the right not to say anything. Okay. Uh, that's it really, but um, uh, really, you know, very enjoyable uh, 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 lecture and very enjoyable discussion. To the, contra to the contrary, Professor Halawa, we have a mother. When we do tissue typing with the mother, we find a, a total mismatch. And then after discussion with the, the uh, she was mother-in-law, and uh, the, uh, the, patient, the patient doesn't know because they found him in where he, while he was very young. And ah. then the caring of him, adoption by adoption, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know that they, she is not his true mother. Mm. And she weeped to donate. So the, sometimes you find a good face in this point. Of course, as, yes. As, as, yes, as you yes. mentioned, the problem is in mismatching, if it's totally mm. mismatched. Mm. Dr. Hadidi, do, do you want to say anything? Uh, when, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you for this elegant presentation. Uh, I'd like you just to add a comment uh, yes, on your yes. question whether. It seemed that the voice stopped. Of course, uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, please, yeah. Muhammad. Yeah, I just like to add a comment yes. on your question whether uh, professionalism equals perfectionism. I think that professionalism is superior to perfectionism. In order to be perfect, you 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 have to, to see uh, written rules and you just uh, follow the rules. But in an era that we live in, like the COVID-19 era, there are no rules. We are fighting a disease we don't know much about. And um, uh, so you have to be a professional. Perfectionism here makes no sense. Yes. Because we are, we are in, in, in an unknown situation. Sometimes you are keen to be perfectionistic. So we can lose many times. And at the end of the day, we can, if, if you have four sectors, and for each sector, you will concentrate on, on one sector. So in this one sector, by perfectionism, we will gain 100%. But you can lose major fraction from other sectors. This is why we don't like perfectionism. Everything should be measured against time. And we like to improve ourselves. So professional seeking, targeting toward the zeroing error rather than perfectionism. At this point, I think it was a very long session. Thank you very much, Professor Halawa. Really, your idea was fantastic to, to join us today.
because it's away from surgery and transplantation. Dr. Tudora, and no words, I, I find no words to express my deep gratitude for your presence and for very valuable comments. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Hadid. Much. Thank you very much and goodbye. Hoping to see you again. Bye-bye. Right. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.